The day that I graduated from the Los Angeles Police Academy was one of the proudest days of my life. I remember when I was sworn in and took the oath of office and they gave me my badge, something that I took seven months working towards. And when they placed it in my hand, that badge felt like it was 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide. It was a shield that I could use to protect me against any of the harms that might come my way as a police officer. It was a great day. After graduating the academy, I went out on patrol and got to meet my clients. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an interesting experience too. They grew up very differently from the way that I did, and I learned a great deal from them. And the more time I spent on the street, the more I realized that all the fantasies that I had early on about changing the world might not exactly come to fruition. And so I worked really hard, and I tried to learn as much as I could about criminals. And here's the thing that I learned. They're pretty smart. They have a great amount of innovation and cleverness. And while I certainly didn't like what they did, I kind of thought the way they did it was noteworthy. And so I tried to learn. One thing that struck me early on was the fact that criminals were using technology in really interesting and innovative ways, ways that the police department were not. As a young patrol officer in the late 80s, I saw a lot of gang members in South Central Los Angeles carrying beepers. In the late 80s, the only people that carried beepers were physicians. And while my little gang bangers kind of acted as if they were in the pharmaceutical industry, <laughs> it turns out that they were not. They were doing something different. And so over the years, I've paid a lot of attention to how bad guys are exploiting technology. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. What I've seen over time is a big paradigm shift in crime. In the old days, people would go out and commit robberies, onesies, twosies. They'd stand on the street corner, wait for somebody put, to come by, put a gun in their face, and then take their wallet or take their purse. It's a great business model, but it doesn't really scale. <laughs> so how do we go about scaling it? Well, years ago, we came up, or bad guys came up, with the idea of a train robbery. I know what we'll do. We'll run up on horses, stop the train, and rob 100 people on board. That was pretty cool for a while, but as technology emerged, there was still a need to scale even further. Thank God somebody invented the internet, where they could really scale this large and big and global. And what we've seen these days, in fact, is that the internet is a great facilitator of crime. Rather than robbing one person or two people, we have people robbing 100 million people. Many of you would have heard of the recent Sony hack, right? Uh, where over 100 million accounts were compromised. Think about that paradigm shift. Never in the history of humankind would it ever have been possible for one person to rob 100 million people simultaneously. You could walk into Yankee Stadium with a gun and point it at everybody, but they're not going to give you their wallets. This technology helps facilitate that. What we're seeing is a change from software as a service to crime as a service. Used to be you had to be a really good hacker, and I'm sure we probably have some here in Silicon Valley in this room that knew how to hack. But hacking was hard, and not everybody could do it. So, turns out, there's an app for that. They've created <laughs> Crimeware, and you can go out and commit crimes using specialized software, and organized crime groups around the world are creating this software for you. You can purchase software and then deploy it to commit crimes. If you have trouble with your software, you can call the 800 number <laughs> for technical support. It comes with service level agreements. If you order 100,000 stolen credit cards, X percentage are guaranteed to work. And by the way, the more stolen credit card numbers you purchase, the bigger your discount. <laughs> the world is changing. It used to be very clear crime and life took place in real space, the space that we're in now. But we've seen a rise in virtual spaces. And though virtual space used to be over here and real space used to be over here, the two are coming together. And that's having a big impact on crime. Things that previously took place purely in virtual space really didn't matter, but now they do. Many people have more friends in Facebook than they do in real life. 
some of us early on had virtual aquariums as screensavers, and we you know, looked at the fish and we thought that was interesting. <laughs> well, now people are putting more and more time into these virtual spaces, and what we're seeing is they really matter, particularly in avatars, 3D worlds, Second Life, uh, MMORPGs, online role-playing games. What happens there counts. People that spend 10, 20 hours a day in these spaces really connect with their avatars, and what happened there matters. So, bad things happen in these spaces too, not just good. And so, if there is a sexual assault of an avatar, should that be a crime? Is that a crime? For the person whose avatar was just sexually assaulted in a violent and graphic way, something wrong happened, something matters, something hurt that person. And while sexual assaults in physical space are clearly very important and something we should be paying attention to, based upon the number of survivors of sexual assault that I've interviewed over the years, one thing is also clear, that in addition to the physical trauma they suffer, there's a fair amount of psychological trauma too. And in the way that people are attaching with their avatars, the same can happen. We also have other interesting questions. In the real space, it's illegal for adults to have sexual relations with children. But this is entirely possible in virtual world. You can craft a very realistic child avatar that you can have sexual relations with in a very graphic way. Is that illegal? Should it be illegal? In the real world, these laws made sense because we were trying to protect real children from real harm. This is just people's fantasies. In the United States, entirely legal. In Europe, illegal. There's no clarity around the world in what's going on here. What I see is a transition in the world of crime. We're moving crime from a two-dimensional space to a three-dimensional space. Drug dealers don't want to miss all the fun. Of course, they're going to become involved in this so that they can drive business. The Cali cartel in Colombia had a $5 million R&D program to look at robotics, and they created the drug sub, capable of carrying 2,000 tons of cocaine up from Latin America at a depth of 100 feet, okay? That's the type of stuff that's going on. We've also seen increasingly terrorists, criminals, and other bad actors tar start to play with do-it-yourself drones. And we've seen cases of this most recently. This is from DEF CON. This is the WASP. This was a handmade, remote-controlled aircraft that had on board a Linux computer, a Wi-Fi hotspot, and a cell phone tower. And this could take off and fly in an automated path around a neighborhood and spoof the Wi-Fi hotspots that people were logging into. It could also spoof itself as a GSM tower so it could intercept your phone calls. And lastly, it had on board a Linux computer with a password hacking dictionary with 380 million entries so it could hack your password on the fly. This is what we're seeing now. And of course, many of you will be familiar that just a few weeks ago, the FBI arrested a student in Boston who planned on loading explosives on one of these devices and attacking both the Capitol and the Pentagon. Robots are getting smaller. Little devices like these will have HD cameras on them. They'll be able to fly into your office and commit industrial espionage, or they can just perch on the girl's locker room windowsill and watch what's going on inside. We're seeing robots being given guns more and more in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's taking off as an issue and something to be concerned about because all of those armed robots are moving into civilian space, and we're also starting to see criminals play by uh, attaching guns to robots too, which unfortunately we have to deal with. We've seen a lot of talk about 3D printers and the ability to print new things in 3D space using a printer. Sounds great. The Economist ran a piece on that recently where they talked about the possibility of print to Stradivarius. Sounds awesome. Of course, a long time ago, I predicted that criminals would up, take up the challenge from 3D printers, and recently we've seen criminals printing ATM skimmers easier than making them by hand or doing it out of metal. Just print these on your 3D printer. Of course, I also three years ago said that criminals would start printing guns as soon as that became possible. And this is a design that you can download from Thingiverse, where you can download designs for 3D printers. And this is the lower receiver of an AR-15 automatic weapon. It is the only part of the firearm that's not controlled by federal law. So now you can just print these and attach all the other metal parts, and you've got a gun and of course your magazines to put your bullets in. As we move forward, great promises of technology, artificial intelligence sounds great. Who remembers Jeopardy and Watson? Sounded awesome. 
Watson, look at all the great things it did. But what happens if Watson turned to a life of crime? How much machine learning could he do against a TRW credit database or a social network? That's what we're going to have to contend with moving forward. We're increasingly integrating biology with information technology. There are 60,000 pacemakers in the United States that are connected to the internet and have an IP address capable of delivering a shock over the internet to the human heart. Great idea if your heart is malfunctioning. Bad idea if your heart is working well. This is the direction that things are going in, unfortunately. Human genome, you'll hear shortly from Andrew Hessel about all the wonderful things that's going on in synthetic biology and genomics. Uh, the human genome is the original operating system. Instead of using ones and zeros, it uses protein base pairs. Phenomenal opportunities for advancement in medicine, but you can also hack the human genome in a way that could cause harm. And in fact, there are groups of biohackers that are out there playing in their garages right now, trying to do interesting things with biology. I'll talk briefly about terrorists because they concern me the most in terms of their uptake of technology. Recently, in 2008, in Mumbai, we had a terrorist attack in which the terrorists took over the Taj Mahal Hotel. Lots of terrorists have been using technology in the past, but these terrorists did three things that really scared me. Number one, they set up their own control room. They were watching BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, and IBN so that they could see what the world was seeing. And so as the attacks were taking place, they had real-time situational awareness f flowing into their terrorist war room. So they were watching. The BBC was saying to the world, if you're in Mumbai, please tell us, call this special number, talk to our producer, we want to chat with you. And as people were calling up the BBC and saying, this is Mr. John Smythe from Hammersmith, I'm trapped in room 557, send help. The terrorist war room was picking it up and in real time over mobile phones, sending it back to their terrorist uh, on the ground. And I know this because I got to listen and read uh, the transcripts of the telephone intercepts. Second innovation that they did, as all this social media and intelligence was created around the scene, as people were doing Facebook entries, Twitter posts, and the like, the terrorists were gathering that data. Within 20 minutes of the Mumbai attack, there was already a Wikipedia page on the event. Thousands of pictures were being uploaded to Flickr, and one picture, the one of the helicopter with the soldiers landing on the building, was tweet-picked around the world. That happened to be the Jewish Community Center. As the terrorists were um, occupying that place, police landed on the roof. Somebody took a picture, tweet-picked it, got picked up by the BBC, broadcast it, terrorist war room heard about it, told the terrorists in the Jewish Community Center, the cops are here, they've landed on the roof reposition yourself to the east stairwell leading to the roof so you can intercept. As a result, the first two Indian National Guards through the door were shot. The first one died. This is real-time situation, situational awareness being done by terrorists. And then lastly, one person who was a hostage, the terrorist walked past his room in the Taj Mahal Hotel. They kicked down the door. He was hiding, covering, cowering, hiding for his life. And here's what they did. They asked him, who are you? What are you doing here? He's like, I'm nobody. Leave me alone. But it didn't make sense to the terrorists because he was in a suite in the Taj Mahal Hotel. He said, I'm just an innocent teacher. Leave me alone. They picked up his documents, and on their mobile phone, they called the terrorist war room, and they Googled him in real time. And here's what we heard on the intercepts. Is he a heavy set chap? Is he bald in front? Does he wear glasses? We found him. Kill him. So as all of us worry about privacy on our Facebook settings, this is what's going on in the world. And it pains me to say that. As a young patrol officer, I decided to dedicate my life to make a difference in this space. And I think that we can. But the one thing that's clear to me is that technology is going much more quickly than the law, public policy, and law enforcement can keep up. And so that's quite a challenge for us. When I came here, Jonathan challenged me to talk about what a wonderful world it is. <laughs> I believe it is a wonderful world. I am a technophile, and I really do believe that people are good at heart. I'm working very hard to make the future, despite all of these technologies and with all of these technologies, the best possible place it can be to live in. But the one thing that is clear to me is that law enforcement can't do it alone. We need your help. We need the good people to come together. And in the same way that the criminals are crowdsourcing the commission of crime, we need to come together as the good people and stand up with the technologies to make a positive difference.
And I invite you to join me in doing that. Thank you very much.